started that um all right well um good evening uh everybody out there in internet land my name is dr ben bellarado i'm the lab director here at crow canyon archaeological center and i am really excited to bring you uh this evening's uh webinar uh entitled lunar twins cahokia's emerald acropolis and chaco's chimney rock in the 11th century with dr timothy pakatat um, and but before we get started, I want to uh, give you a little introduction to the webinar series and talk to you a little bit about how uh, different ways you can improve your viewing experience. So we'll jump into that. So first, though, um, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, or Navajo, and the Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homeland this institution sits and upon which we work and reside. Our mission related work would not be possible without indigenous people in the past, present and future. And we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections and sacred lands. Our mission here at Crow Canyon is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. And you can find out more about our programs, our education uh, uh, programs, and our uh, American Indian initiatives um, at crowcanyon.org. Our campus is set just outside of uh, Cortez, Colorado, and just at the head of Ute Mountain Ute. And here you can see a picture of that with the Ute Mountain in the background and uh, our, our campus up in front. And as soon as we open to the public, we invite you to uh, come check out our, our campus. Um, and again, you can, you can uh, look more into our programs at crowdkidding.org. So I'm um, going to give you a couple tips on how to uh, enhance or improve or just maximize your viewing experience uh, for the great webinar tonight. Uh, over the last couple of years, a lot of people uh, around the world have been become very familiar with Zoom, the video conferencing program. But just in case you, you haven't had the opportunity yet, um, I'll give you a couple tips here. So first of all, we like to say you can move the talking heads. So um, at least on my screen, when I pull up Zoom over in the upper right corner, you can see a couple different people in little boxes, including myself and, uh, and Tim and, and Taylor. And um, if those little boxes are in your way or they're kind of you know getting in the way of the presentation you can go ahead and take your cursor and click on the top and you can change the configuration of of those or even uh drag and move them around <clears throat> so um you in case it's covering up uh, some of the pictures that tim's going to show us um we also invite you to ask questions <clears throat> and at the end of the presentation um uh, we'll be asking uh Dr. Pak the uh, some questions uh, on his presentation, and we ask that you add those to the Q and A box. So here you can see this box uh, with chat, raise hand, Q and A, and live transcript. And if you click on that Q and A, you can go ahead and type in your questions. And Taylor, our webinar guru, and I will be trying to compile similar questions throughout the presentation, uh, so we can we can streamline those and and um, and and try to answer as many as we can. Um, and let's see, if you're having difficulties uh, viewing this for whatever reason, you can also head over to our live stream at crowcanyon.org slash Facebook. And that's our, our Facebook connection. Uh, and that's really, it's got like a one or two second delay. So it's pretty much, you know, um, uh, to, the, to the second. Um, and um, you can even ask some questions in there and we'll do our best to address those ones as well. Uh, if you want to watch this presentation again later, which I'm sure a lot of us will, or watch any of our previous presentations from, from uh, prior webinars, you can uh, go to our YouTube channel, which is crowcanyon.org slash YouTube, and um, you can view those there. And we, we ask you to like and subscribe, and that uh, if we get enough of those, it helps us unlock additional uh, functions that'll help enhance your uh, viewing experience even more. 
Okay, so um, in the next couple of weeks, we have uh, additional webinars every Thursday. And um, uh, next week's is uh, co-sponsored by the Four Corners Lecture Series. And it's entitled Dog Life and Death in an Ancestral Pueblo Landscape with Victoria Monagale. And that's Thursday, May 12th at 4 p.m. Uh, and then following that, um, we have another uh, Four Corners Lecture Series uh, co-sponsored co event. Um, and this one's entitled The Point Great House, a ceremonial center of the Middle San Juan region in the Northern Southwest uh, by my friend and mentor and colleague, Linda Wheelbarger. And that's Thursday, May 19th at uh, 4 p.m. And, and definitely check that one out. Linda actually gave my first job in archaeology, so I definitely will, will be there. Um, and both of these webinars should be really interesting, so um, check them out. And then we'll have additional webinars every Thursday at 4 p.m. So um, now I'll go ahead and uh, introduce tonight's talk um, entitled Lunar Twins, Cahokia's Emerald Acropolis and Chaco's Chimney Rock in the 11th century with Dr. Timothy Pakatat. Um, and before before I turn it over to Tim, I want to tell you a little bit about him. So um, uh, Tim uh, Pakita is the director of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. The Illinois State, or he's also the Illinois State Archaeologist and a professor of medieval studies and anthropology at the University of Illinois in Cham uh, Champaign-Urbana. He has researched the Mississippi Valley, in particular the late pre-colonial or Mississippian area for 30 plus years, focusing on the great urban phenomena of Cahokia and its outliers far to the north in Wisconsin and to the south in Mississippi and Louisiana. Uh, he's the author or editor of 17 books, uh, the most recent of which include a North American textbook written by or written with Ken Sassman, uh, entitled The Archaeology of Ancient North America, which is published by Cambridge uh, in 2020. And his forthcoming uh, popular book explores the historical and religious connections between Mesoamerica, the Southwest, and the Mississippi Valley, and is entitled Gods of Thunder, How Climate Change, Travel, and Spirituality Reshaped Pre-Colonial America, which will be uh, published by Oxford Press in 2023. So check that out. Um, well, yeah, without further ado, I want to go ahead and uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Timothy Pakutet. Um, and um, thank you so much for joining us this, this evening, and we really look forward to uh, your presentation. Thank you, Ben. Let me share my screen. There, how's that? Uh, thank you, Ben. Also, thank you, Taylor, for uh, um, setting this up and getting, getting us going tonight. Uh, it's great to be back here with my friends uh, at Crow Canyon. Um, done a number of tours, and in fact, one or two kind of bouncing between Cahokia and Chaco, and at some point stopping at Chimney Rock. So <clears throat> Crow Canyon has very much been you know, part of, of me and my research in, in the recent past. And um, what I'm gonna do tonight is not dwell too much on Chimney Rock because some of you are gonna know it uh, as well as I do, <clears throat> but show you some parallels to, to uh, uh, actually more than one site, three or four sites, over in another part of North America, Cahokia, which is in some ways very different from the Chacoan world, as many of you know, and in other ways is remarkably similar and, and happening at the same time as things are happening in Chaco. Uh, <clears throat> and for instance, uh, I mean, I've always for 20 years or more been amazed at not only are there some site parallels, um, but the timing is, uh, is so close to major developments in the Chacoan world of Southwest and the Mississippi Valley world of Cahokia that you, you, uh, there must have been something that, that was behind the similar developments. And here, if you look at this chronology um, at the bottom, uh, a special attention to the, to the 11th century um, after 1000, where you have Chimney Rock and all the lunar um, rituals happening at Chimney Rock pretty much contained within that century uh, at, at the same time that the Chaco is expanding and all of its outliers um, are coming online and at the same time that something similar is happening in the Cahokia world. I won't necessarily 
At the end, I'll, I'll leave you with some thoughts about why. But for this talk, I really, you know, I've done similar talks like this in the, in the recent past. Some of you might have seen one or two of them. I'm going to try to focus more on some interesting patterns at the level of the archaeological site, especially this emerald, pfeffer, uh, um, so those emerald and pfeffer sites in the near Cahokia, and then one a little farther away, Trumpelo um, in western Wisconsin, where I've done work over the last 10 to, 10 to 15 years. Um, the first thing that, that captivated my attention in terms of the parallels between um, the Chacoan world, especially Chimney Rock, and then uh, the Cahokian world, especially these three sites that I just mentioned, is their lunar orientations um, happening at roughly the same time. And by lunar orientations, what I mean is that they are both constructed in a way that they are aligned to, or in some ways, um, uh, timed with the long lunar cycle, which uh, I know I know many of you will already be somewhat familiar with this, given the literature in the Southwest and around Chaco. But basically, you know, the moon. We all know about the moon's uh, uh, monthly cycle um, over the course of a year, leading to twelve months. Um, but fewer people today kind of appreciate that there's a long lunar cycle that. Um, uh, it takes 18.6 years to, to occur. Um, and in that 18.6 year span, if you're watching the full moons especially, uh, you'll see uh, uh, during one year out of those 18.6 more or less, you'll see the, uh, the moon rise and set, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, rise and set at extremes over the course of the year. Um, this is because the, the moon um, uh, revolves around the earth on a, at an angle that's slightly off the earth's ecliptic or the angle, I mean, or the orbit away uh, at which the earth uh, revolves around the sun, that offset is around five degrees, uh, explains why it takes a full 18.6 years for the moon to actually complete its um, long cycle. Uh, 9.3 9 .3 years into this 18.6 year cycle, let me put up another graphic, it, it actually sets, um, rises and sets uh, within a narrower band over the course of the year. If you're watching the, if you're watching the, uh, the full moons um, every month. So what I'm showing you here is you'll see there's a Northern lunar maximum and a Southern lunar maximum over the course of one, roughly one year out of 18.6 or so, the moon will uh, rise at both extremes. Uh, 9.3 years later, it will rise and set at the minimum positions um, over the course of that year. And in the right landscapes, over the, with sufficient time, people can perceive this. Um, I, I'm starting to watch it myself for the last, uh, not quite 18.6 years. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, the most fam one of the more famous one sites in, in North America, which um, uh, modern day archaeologists and archaeoastronomers have deduced that past people recognize this is because it's so obvious, it's Chimney Rock, uh, where the northern lunar uh, maximum moonrise um, happens in between the, the two towers uh, um, at Chimney Rock, when viewed from, of course, the Chaco and Great House that was constructed, presumably to uh, commemorate and observe this um, once in a generation event. Uh, it's not just Chimney Rock, of course, and there's a you know robust literature, some of it contentious about um, Chaco in general and Chaco and Great Houses um, being aligned to uh, the long lunar cycle or various positions of this of this lunar cycle, as well as to other um, terrestrial features and and celestial features. And I bet many of you have, you know, have been up on Chimney Rock and you've walked um, through the, the uh, Chakwin Great House, if not also the, uh, the, uh, the village area down lower uh, in the background, um, all dating mostly with, to the 11th century. Um, and uh, it's a pretty special place. 
Uh, also, the recent archaeology, and, and this, uh, the most recent that I'm aware of, was by Steve Lexen, um, and with the help of a uh, grad student and other students, but um, Brenda Todd, who wrote a, a dissertation on this, and actually did some some of the comparisons of which about which I'm also talking. Um, their work uh, recovered more uh, dendro samples, um, complementing earlier work that also show that a lot of the cutting dates and the construction of, of a chimney rock great house happened um, in or real close to um, these uh, major and minor lunar events on this long 18.6 year cycle. <clears throat> and of course, you know, again, if you've been up there, you also realize it's a, it's a fantastic uh, a landmark and, uh, <clears throat> and it, you can, it can be seen from far away. And in fact, it's just two, two viewing points away from Chaco Canyon itself. Um, so Chimney Rock up in the upper right and Pueblo Alto um, next to uh, Chaco Canyon being on the lower, lower left part of the, of the uh, screen. Um, this kind of inner visibility, of course, is so is what makes the whole Chaco world so amazing. Can't quite, we can't quite match that in the Mississippi Valley, but you'll see there's, uh, um, inner visibility is of some concern there as well. Uh, so this is a, it, this is chimney rock from the side, and I put this up here only because um, to show you the importance of uh, of such a landmark. And of course, Chaco and folks uh, built a lot of great houses uh, astride or on or near uh, significant um, features of the landscape. Uh, we now think that something very similar was happening in the Eastern United States, if not around the world, uh, in the Mississippi Valley. But there in the Mississippi Valley, of course, our, our chimney rocks aren't quite as dramatic uh, as Chimney Rock, Colorado. Um, in fact, this is a prominent hill uh, at the edge of the Illinois Prairie, just outside of Cahokia, about 15, 16 miles. Um, this is what we're now calling, Susan Alt and I, based on a, some work we've been doing there, uh, the Emerald Acropolis. Um, it was, a, it's a series of e uh, elevated uh, Cahokian uh, occupations uh, and 12 mounds. In fact, the, the trees in the middle next to the, the barn in the background there um, is a large seven meter tall um, four-sided platform mound. That's the one that you can see here in this artist's reconstruction in the upper right. That's the, uh, the big earthen mound that um, was in those trees. And what you can't see in that earlier shot is, and in fact, we couldn't see for a long time before we had access to LIDAR, <clears throat> you know, laser, the aerial laser scanning of the ground, were the other 11 mounds, which we're now fairly confident we know where they are and they're shown here. Um, I won't go into mound shapes. Um, it's enough to know that there are 12 of them, which is, of course, an important number. And and uh, you know the uh, in terms of the number of months in a year, uh, and interestingly enough, once we had lidar and once we also did a little bit of work um, ground truthing some of the locations of these mounds, uh, but also some more work on the uh, uh, the buildings that are all around this this acropolis. Um, you can see here uh, uh, the orientation of the site grid generally. Is, is tightly um, associated with the maximum northern moonrise at, at this latitude um, and at the, with a horizon angle that, that um, exists here at this position. Uh, so there are, there are rows of mounds that, um, that seem to point to this important position once every 18.6 years or so and orthogonal angles. Um, and we, in our excavations, we find the very same thing that many of the buildings, especially the important uh, religious or uh, um, uh, you know, high status buildings are, are on this very same axis and oftentimes aligned with precision to it. Uh, one last thing that I wanna mention here, again, this, I call it, we call this an Acropolis in part because it, it was a natural hill that was then modified. Uh, we have good evidence of cutting and filling so that the Cahokians uh, who, who ended up kind of uh, building this up um, 
uh, around the same year that Cahokia began to expand um, itself, the city of Cahokia, they perfected the alignment by cutting and filling um, and then adding those mounds to accentuate this uh, maximum northern moonrise position. Uh, this all started back when I was a grad student and I was concerned that this mound, which you can see the central big platform, uh, well, had been damaged by some backhoeing into it. Uh, somebody had planned to remove it entirely at one point, and that backhoe cut was eroding. And um, early on, whoops, let's see here. Let's see, do that again. Yeah, early on, I just simply documented that profile and was kind of amazed to find what is a, a kind of plaster. Um, uh, on top of an earlier stage of this platform. So you can see there's below, I call it a sod block construction fill. They built up this mound. Then at some point they're ready to put buildings on top. They flatten it. But in this case, they actually do it by adding 12 alternating layers of light and dark plaster of a sort. Again, the number 12. Um, and then later they, they actually increase the height of the mound. They add another series of mantles um, on top of it then. So this intrigued me uh, way back in the late 90s. <clears throat> uh, when we came back here in the 2012 uh, through 2016 or so, we followed up on some of these ideas and the, the, the patterning around the, that we started to see around the, what we thought was related to the long lunar cycle became clearer. Um, and what you're looking at here is a bird's eye of a couple of our excavation blocks. And those rectangles are the floors of semi-subterranean uh, pole and thatched buildings. Um, some of these, including one or two of those that you see there are now we're calling shrine houses. They don't seem to be living quarters at all. They seem to be small little prayer houses, if you will. Um, where people might go for special occasions connected to the uh, a timed with the, the long lunar cycle, occasionally little offerings being left behind. And this entire Emerald Acropolis now, maybe somewhat unlike Chimney Rock, um, looks to be only intermittently used and potentially intermittently used every 9.3 years or every 18.6 years uh, when their people um, process back out to this ridge, build all new buildings and uh, conduct uh, maybe season long um, rituals and then go back a lot, just going back to Cahokia itself. We think this in part because what you're looking at here is a map of, of a bunch of superimposed uh, palimpsest of these pole and thatched building floors the uh, uh, you know four walls uh, and then the floor in between and but then they're clearly you can see they're frequently rebuilt and not all of them but <clears throat> a good number of them um, align to one of those four important moonrise positions uh, lunar maximum lunar minimum positions uh, as calculated on this spot on the larger ridge <clears throat> clearly not all of them do. But then again, we also have a hard time controlling for there's such a crowding of buildings on top of this Acropolis that it could be that there are other buildings in the way. And so they're adjusting their buildings to take into account the fact there's a roof in the way and they're aligning to the moon if it, as it rises over the top of the adjacent roof. We're not entirely sure. But the important point here is the lunar aligned. Um, we do have dates that we don't have dendro dates, but we have uh, enough C14 dates that we think that there's a patterning associated, you know, uh, the dates are conforming to major and minor events. Um, and these are temporary houses uh, with hardly any storage pits near them. They're, they're not, these people are not staying here long. They're there long enough to engage in a, in a lunar ceremonial, we think. And that's all outside of Cahokia. In fact, you can see Emerald um, about 15 miles or so to the east of that kind of oddly shaped diamond and, and a red blob next to it, which is a, the, the uh, tripartite complex of Greater Cahokia as we now understand it. Um, an urban complex that emerges and really expands 
pretty much at the same time that some other um, mounded complex, including emerald, and then one next to it called pfeffer, are, are um, enlarged and uh, formalized. <clears throat> um, and by the way, you see there's a, a circular radius, or a circle drawn around Cahokia itself. The radius of that circle is about 40 miles. And this is the zone within which um, Cahokia has a really strong impact. Uh, and there are farmers living all over this. Uh, and then when you move out to the east towards Emerald there, you're entering the Illinois Prairie. And so if there's one, one place that you want to be, if you want to do uh, some good moon watching, it's right out of the edge of that prairie, since looking east is an un unobstructed, relatively flat horizon um, with which to watch such things. <clears throat> um, Cahokia itself, interestingly, is not directly lunar aligned. Uh, and, and a lot of uh, head scratching has gone into its alignment. Um, and it, it has become clear, uh, again, with the help of LIDAR, that it's aligned to multiple things. Um, and that alignment is, is built into this location at 1050, uh, you know, which is just a few years after the Chaco and expansion really is, is started. <clears throat> uh, this is it today, uh, National Geographic view of it. Um, if you've never seen this before, this is just the core of the largest of three precincts that are all connected with more mounds that stretch from here uh, about eight miles to the west and hop the river into St. Louis, the modern day city of St. Louis and, and a pre-Columbian um, pre-contact complex of mounds as well. There are different kinds of mounds in the foreground. You can see a circular one, a circular platform and then a rectangular platform. And in the back, you can see the 100 foot tall um, a monk's mound, a, a big um, rectangular multi-terrace platform. Um, so third, third or fourth largest uh, new world pyramid. And in a LIDAR view, um, what you can see is our current understanding of that central core of the of the main precinct um, and its axis, which is uh, actually the whole complex is built at five degrees um, off north, which is not again a lunar angle. <clears throat> and I won't belabor this um, except to say that it encodes both uh, alignment to the Milky Way, as um, Bill Romain has recently calculated it, and also. Um, um, references to both the uh, summer solstice and the sunrise and, uh, and the um, uh, southern maximum moonrise. And I'm not going to really explain that too much, but just you know, take it on faith. Uh, there's also um, a, a Lac Chaco, uh, like many early cities. These alignments aren't just to local features, they're to um, distant features or think, you know, um, um, trying to build this center in, in a position that it has is intervisible, you know, with other complexes. And here I'm just highlighting that the main axis actually ties into a prominent um, woodland era, 2000 year old burial mound on the bluffs, which is important in this location because it's establishing that um, something else that Cahokia is aligned to. And that is to the south of this mound, there is a unique landscape of caves, uh, karst topography, um, which among um, descendants today uh, um, is typically associated with the land of the dead and world of the spirits. Um, and that same alignment, and we're kind of looking across it here from Monk's Mound all the way down to that woodland burial mound here um, <clears throat> at nightfall and the summer solstice is the, uh, it's aligned to the, um, the Milky Way itself, right? which moves around a lot at night. But this is probably significant because the Milky Way among descendants, of course, is also a bridge into um, the afterlife, into the world of ancestral spirits, um, as well as all those caves that are down in that same um, area to the south. Oh, and one last thing. Um, this alignment happen, happens to happen uh, when the, the, uh, the moon is passing, the full moon is passing through the Milky Way 
So in a way, what they're kind of building into the city is the cosmos, the entire cosmos, the sun, the moon as it's passing through the Milky Way, and then the Milky Way itself. It's a it's a pretty extraordinary um, place uh, uh, astronomically. <laughs> but let's go back out to then these chimney rock like sites. And so I showed you emerald. Uh, it turns out there's another um, slightly smaller version of emerald just a couple miles away from it that we also had done some work on uh, 15 or more years ago now. And um, that is the Pfeffer site. And so by showing you some features of the Pfeffer site, you, you'll begin to see um, more kind of similarities to Chimney Rock. And then I'll end with, with one more site up in Wisconsin. Um, this is, like I say, a small version of the Emerald site. Uh, you can see the, the scale at the bottom. It, this particular site was, it had nine mounds, um, also in rows, we now think, although most are destroyed. Here's a row of three, maybe a, a row of three going this way. Um, the rest are gone. Uh, you can see this clearly there's a subdivision built over it. There's a golf course built over it up here. This part where we were doing some salvage excavations in the early 2000s is now gone. Um, and it's a uh, shopping mall, um, nursing home, and other, other things like that. And unfortunately, we also lost a big, several, well, at least two big chunks of it to unscrupulous uh, developers who knew there was an archaeological site here. And um, before we could finish salvaging um, what we had exposed, did this to it, which was uh, bulldoze it away. Uh, and you can see a very dissatisfied archaeologist, Brad Koldehoff, standing out in the middle of this destroyed portion. Uh, the area in red here, you can see our, our, our excavations is the light colored white area with all those green rectangles being um, uh, pole and thatch building floors seen in, in plan view. And then the areas within red were destroyed, um, destroyed portions of the site. You can get a sense for what is an unusual site. Uh, buildings that are kind of scattered across this um, hilltop with the mounds to the north. Um, uh, in part, that's because this was a short-term site. This site we now think only really lasted from about 1050 to about 1100. Um, or two, maybe three of uh, those lunar cycles. And, and again, there's kind of good evidence that it lasted two or three lunar cycles based on the patterning of these small pole and thatch buildings. And so here you're looking at Brenda Todd, who actually worked out at Chimney Rock, also working here at uh, the Pfeffer site, uh, um, documenting a storage pit in the floor of one of these small pole and thatch buildings. Get a sort of a sense, these are mostly sleeping huts. Um, with little activity going on inside, um, just enough room to, for our family to, to uh, spend the night. There's another version, just so you can have a good sense for what we're dealing with. You can even see the, the dark um, walls around the edges. Those are little um, builder's trenches or ditches where a vertical wall of posts would have been set. And then a thatched roof would have been added to the top and, the, and these circular circles here are, are storage pits. What we, what we realized here, in fact, we kind of figured out the pattern here first, if ever, was that, uh, oh, so we, ha we have both minor and major um, uh, standstills or positions on the long, um, long lunar cycle represented uh, in the way they're uh, building and then rebuilding um, their pole and thatch architecture. That is, what you're seeing here is an early building, this, this one, that's aligned um, to a, a maximum lunar, um, a maximum moon rise, a northern moon rise. And then probably this, is, this falls into disuse. We have evidence of that. And later, 9.3 years later, there's a um, minimum or, or minor um, moonrise happening and they return to the site 
Maybe the same family erects a new building aligned to the next major event. This, they were finding that we found this all over this site. And, and as you know already, all over the Emerald site as well. Um, and this particular building uh, linked, uh, this particular building was the one that finally convinced me um, because this was a, uh, a kind of a big shrine house with a yellow floor. Um, and the building itself was built to a minor position of the moon on this long cycle. Uh, later, um, this, this people who built this probably had abandoned it, but then somebody came back and reopened the building and they added this really unusual depression that is actually aligned then to what um, is a maximum North moon rise position. I hope this isn't too confusing. I tend to confuse myself if I talk about this too much, but here's the same building. Um, and what you're seeing is, is the, the uh, depression on the floor, which is very linear, which is, uh, I had never seen anything up to this point. We've actually found a couple of these since. Um, and the building itself, and you can see the yellow uh, floor perhaps and, the, and all the individual post holes um, along the sides, right? With some hearths in the interior as well. Uh, unlike almost any other site except the Emerald site, the storage pits are what probably weren't storage pits at all, but the pits next to these kinds of aligned buildings also had special features. Uh, and by special features, I mean they were lined with yellow clay, much like the important buildings themselves, and then a dark clay. And they're, the, these uh, linings are, are potentially a way of ritually preparing um, that location to receive um, powerful substances uh, that are buried in that location. Um, so, uh, and this lining is actually, a, it was a, applied in a liquid state um, as was this next lining. And I say that because we, I think, yeah, if you, if you excavated these carefully, you're looking at two sides of a pit like that where you can see where are the dark, um, filled depressions uh, from somebody's hand as they were smearing the yellow lining into that in, into that uh, pit bottom. And you can kind of see how uh, it so, uh, follows a circular pattern. And you can see multiple fingers kind of smearing in that yellow that yellow lining. This These are unique and they mark, again, these special pits that are um, associated with some kind of ritual event and presumably connected to um, the, the uh, ceremonies associated with that uh, celebrating that long lunar cycle. Uh, and, and, you know, for the archaeologists out in the crowd who really like dirt, um, there's even more details here that, that uh, are, for me are kind of astounding because it's not just that there are these aligned pits but there's the fill itself sometimes that they add is special fill. In fact, if you can see, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. This is the same pit. You can see the yellow lining and then the, the dark lining on the bottom of the pit. And then what is added is a mixture of dark and yellow fill, which is a, a lot like mound fill, but they're placing it in this pit. It's a kind of offering probably. And then uh, interestingly, especially this was visible once we took the second half of this dark fill off here, somebody took their foot or their hand and they, they compressed that lower fill to pack it down there nice and tight. Occasionally, you will, we, we found burned offerings in, in, the, in the fill in a pit like this, projectile points, ax heads, animal bones. Uh, and these kind of, uh, uh, use of the yellow lining um, uh, reached extremes. I mean, there, there's uh, several instances of something I'm trying to show here that may be difficult to understand, but uh, if you have a, a house basin that you're living in and then you leave for 9.3 years, if you don't do it yourself, that, that house basin will naturally kind of fill in with earth or maybe some people throw garbage into it. Uh, the next group of people come back 9.3 years later, and there's at this particular site, there seems to be a very intentional attempt to reference that earlier, those earlier people and that earlier house by digging back down into the fill atop the floor 
and, and applying new yellow clay. And so what you're seeing here is a rectangular patch of yellow clay that, that was smeared in the bottom of a hole that was added or dug back into an earlier house before they then um, added more burn ritual materials on top of that yellow um, patch of rectangular fill. It gets more complicated. And, and the point of all of this is this is not an ordinary living site. And all people who are showing up here are engaged in some extremely thick, literally and figuratively thick ritual. Um, uh, it's not just the people on the mounds, um, it's everybody. Uh, and it, it extends to uh, after they leave. Um, and by that, I mean, here's, a, here's another yellow lined shrine house. Um, probably not used as a house, but used as a, as a prayer facility, you know, or a place that people would go to a temple, a miniature temple. They very carefully um, fill in these locations after they're done with them. And that often means by adding, uh, by using water and pouring water in or waiting for a, a rainstorm to come in and fill it in naturally, such that the, the fill in this particular building which you're seeing here being excavated just to, so you can see what this is like. We're not quite to the, the first floor of this. Um, uh, this is that same building in cross section. And it's this extraordinary sequence of, well, there was a, originally one floor down here has a yellow lining. They came back and packed in that yellow and black prepared fill, which is a lot like mound fill, not a single artifact in it. They gave it a new floor at this level. After they were done, they allowed rain to come in or they poured water in. They added more packed prepared mound fill. After that, they allowed another rain to come in, then sort of burn debris and more rain and more burn debris. I don't think any of that was accidental. It was very intentionally part of the prolonged ritual associated with this uh, long lunar cycle. Um, even to the point that they'd come back after the whole thing was filled up, they re-excavated into such deposits. Here you can see the outer ring of the bullseye is a re-excavation. A post is put in the floor. They allow it to rain. Rainwater fills up the hole along with silt. At some point, they pull the post out and they add that same yellow and black packed mound fill into the hole uh, where the post had been. Um, very carefully tending to probably this, you know, the spiritual power of this, uh, of every single one of these locations. <clears throat> you know, Chimney Rock had, you know, special um, uh, evidence of special rituals as well. Uh, there is one more site that I want to throw in here that is actually a slightly more chimney rock, and it is um, a Cahokian site, um, 600 linear kilometers away from Cahokia to the north. It's up at Trempolo. Uh, because Cahokians, uh, uh, one chimney rock was not enough for Cahokians. They had to have multiple chimney rocks. So here we are at a place called Trempolo, Wisconsin. Like chimney rock, it's a special landform. It's a a, um, an isolate, an upland isolate uh, in the rugged, unglaciated part of Wisconsin with caves and springs and um, craggy rock exposures um, and also earlier burial mounds on one end. And Cahokians arrive and they go to this little bluff location and they proceed to build um, shelters for themselves. Cahokian houses on the left, they leave their Cahokian debris on the right. And uh, they build a, what's a, their version of chimney rock on top of a hundred foot high um, ridge. And what you're seeing outlined in green on the left is a rectangular Cahokian platform mound with a couple of terraces, one on either side, and then a couple more little mounds at the end of causeways that you can't really see here so well. And in doing that, um, our geomorphologist was able to determined that they physically, a lot like Emerald, the Emerald Acropolis, physically reoriented, reoriented, reoriented the natural ridge such that it too 
points to a, a minimum North Moonrise position, um, as in fact did the, the, the natural land itself in this location. So we think like, <clears throat> like Chimney Rock, you have a unique landform that people, maybe even before Cahokia was built, uh, understood was naturally aligned or had some special qualities that if you visited there, you could see the moon, you know, in, in alignment with that um, natural uh, escarpment right here. Um, to perfect their connection with that um, lunar cycle and with this place, they constructed their version of Chimney Rock right on top um, and modified it enough so that it, it, it uh, it's aligned perfectly with the minimum north moonrise at this position. So we know of these three. Uh, there are more in the, in the Cahokia region. And so <clears throat> at this point, given that, and also given where we started with, with um, Chimney Rock, I want to ask, and I spent a lot of time asking this of myself, and maybe you know, ask you, why are there such similarities at the same time? Uh, the Mississippian world, the Cahokian world of the Mississippi Valley, and the world of Chaco Canyon, especially at Chimney Rock. And there's a few things I want you to think about. Uh, one, um, almost all pre-modern people um, or non-Western non groups uh, um, connect to their world differently than people in the, in the modern world do. And that is, um, they're a bit more animistic. That is, there's a less rigid division between you know, the individual human being and the other things out in the natural world, such that people often um, feel that there are spiritual powers resident in special land, land forms um, or in the moon or the sun. Uh, and that to understand those spiritual forces, you have to align yourself with those, right? So there's this Pan-American animism that, that helps explain some of this. Uh, both Cahokians and Chacoans and probably a lot of other people in North and South America um, uh, do similar kinds of things because of this substrate of belief, right? <clears throat> then we have to um, recognize there's, there's more going on here than that because there's this uh, thing called the medieval warm period that starts happening um, in the 800s. And there's a whole lot of changes happening from Mesoamerica up into North America, whether it's Southwest or the Mississippi Valley, probably because as Steve Lexon would argue, these folks knew about each other. Um, and there might as well have been visitation, um, pilgrimages of a sort, certain people making one-off trips to other locations, whether it be Cahokia to Chaco or Chaco to Mesoamerica or Cahokia to Mesoamerica. Um, it's driven by climate change in part, um, there's also lots of other special things happening in the way of celestial events in the 11th century. It's also important that wh whereas the Southwest um, Puebloan groups had corn for a couple thousand years, Cahokians didn't uh, until 900. Um, and that, in fact, most people in the Eastern Rupas did not have corn. But once you do get corn, what really matters is rain and water so you can um, understand um, and maximize the corn crop. And uh, the moon is associated with rain in, among many peoples in, in North America because the moon can be seen as a rain bringer um, uh, given the ring around the moon. Um, and also that you know, it, you, people can time their planting um, and their um, uh, time their world relative to the cycle, the annual cycle of the moon. All right. <clears throat> Um, another important thing that might help explain these parallels uh, is the importance of Chaco and Cahokia themselves. That is, big centers where lots of people are going uh, require um, a big idea that might challenge people's understanding of the world. So for those big ideas to take root, a Chaco or a Cahokia has to build the knowledge of the outside world into the centers. And what better way of doing that than by building a series of chimney rocks or sh shrine complexes, as we would call them in the Mississippi Valley, around the, the centers. And those can be really far away. They can be 600 kilometers away, or they can be right up close. And by um, having special people out there understanding the long lunar cycle, 
um, you can bring that back and proclaim it in the in the city center, you know, or the ceremonial center. Um, and then that, that sort of shores up and legitimates those places, in this case, Chaco and Cahokia. So <clears throat> um, uh, I guess I, I present those ideas as challenges and I'm wondering what you all think and um, I'll stop there. Great, well, thank you so much, Tim. That was really amazing. Um, wow. <clears throat> so much to digest that's amazing um well yeah we have a bunch of questions so why don't i get you to um let's see we can either have you stop your slide share or we can flip back if there's things that you're you're want to want to reference yeah. we can go back and forth awesome. um, all right great well <clears throat> wow so much to digest that's awesome um so let's see here so there was a few questions about the yellow clay. Um, so we'll just start there, I guess. Um, you talk a lot about that. And so uh, one of the, the viewers asks is, you know, is yellow clay specifically ritualistic? Is it widespread? Uh, where did it come from? And can you tell us just a bit more about that? Uh, we, we have seen it being used from Trempolo in Wisconsin all the way, and these are by Cahokians, all the way down to Cahokia, and especially at those shrine complexes to the east. So it, it's not typically used though in any ordinary house. Um, and it, it makes for a very nice floor, but I think I agree with the, with the person asking this question, probably this is signaling a special um, a ritual floor, maybe a way of sort of sealing or preparing what happens inside that building and um, purifying that location and allowing these special things to happen inside those particular buildings or inside that particular pit. Uh, you know, uh, it generally had gone unrecognized until we were, we were working at that Pfeffer site. Um, uh, and then we started noticing it. And then I think because we, the time we were looking, I was looking for villages of uh, farmers in the uplands, we just happened to hit on that site and then realized there was a lunar pattern. And then we followed that over to Emerald and then up to Trempolo um, among other places. And I, it's still not, so it's not normal. It's not ordinary. It's still special. Uh, and I think we've kind of found the main sites at which they're doing that. Hmm. And I, yeah, I think it's associated with the moon. I have no idea if the color yellow really, if they're trying to, key that into the moon or to corn or to some other kind of yellow materials, I wouldn't be totally surprised. Interesting. Um, and do you have any sense of like where the, like the, was all the yellow coming from the same source or that yellow clay or is it just where sort they of. encountered it or do you have any thoughts? It's coming from um, the, the less bluffs along the Mississippi River. So Luss is yellow. And if you go down into it deep enough where the, the, the clays have kind of filtered down over the, over the uh, centuries, or I guess, you know, millennia, um, you can get a clay version of the Luss. And also it can be kind of, it can be pretty bright yellow. And it doesn't look like it's coming from one, one location along the bluffs, but that uh, the people at Trempolo, the Cahokians at Trempolo are getting it up there and using it. The ones near Cahokia are getting it locally on the bluffs near Cahokia. Hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, so then uh, along a similar lens, then um, uh, these, the, you, you mentioned the 12 lenses of uh, black and white levels um, in that slide you, went, you were talking about. Um, are these also pretty common color? Uh, the red and white uh, amongst the Mississippians or? or... Uh, not around Cahokia. Uh, uh, red and white, you do see in the Mississippian world commonly, especially to the South uh, later in the, in the kind of classic middle Mississippian cultures, you know, Moundville and Etowah and, and whatever. Uh, Cahokia, you don't see, I mean, you do see red and white, but mostly you see black and yellow 
And in that particular slide, the, the white and black, I sort of suspected that, that white is kind of a yellowish white and that they were going after the yellow still. Um, um, but for whatever reason, it's not a very brilliant yellow. So, yeah. Oh yeah, right. Sorry. Yeah, you said you said uh, black, not red. Um, yeah, and um, so then, in addition to the lunar alignments, one uh, viewer was asking if there's any references you found to to Venus or any other astral bodies or uh, constellations that we recognize, things like that. Uh, no, except the Milky Way. And, and that's, you know, that's kind of a, a, a recent um, understanding. Uh, and it's, it's not, just so the, not just the Milky Way either. It's sort of the Milky Way in conjunction with the moon passing through it. And, and so what you will see is a, from, from a Arkansas up uh, where some Caddo people were doing this first up to Cahokia is a circular and a square mound linked with a causeway in a way that suggests that the causeway represents uh, the Milky Way. And then they'll align that causeway or the orthogonal of the causeway to a lunar position. So it seems to me, and I, there's some agreement with an uh, archaeoastronomer friend, that what they're showing you there is not just the Milky Way and not just the moon, both. Uh, and yeah, and so and those are basic. I mean, the Milky Way also is a very basic uh, phenomena. I mean, people, everybody would see it. So that would really be impressive for most people. They'd see it nightly. The understanding of the lunar cycle would be something more, uh, you know, a priestly kind of knowledge, I think, because it would take a long time and you don't see that every night. And the moon is very complicated. And even most of us don't understand that long cycle. Right, right. Well, and that leads right into another question of, um, yeah, who do you think, and, and and you just mentioned that a little bit, but can you talk more about who you think um, was maybe setting these these structures up in their alignments? So, and, um, was it the local folks, or was it folks specifically coming from Cahokia, or some intermediary in between? Or, uh, you know, that was one of the research questions we had when we when we finally approached Emerald. And it's, uh, we excavated enough structures there, um, in part because we had to, because that part of that site was being destroyed. Um, but we've excavated enough that we could see that the, the main religious buildings, the more public ones, um, are very precisely aligned. When you get to the smaller shrine houses, uh, probably serving a specific clan or you know, uh, some kind of family, um, they're a little bit less uh, uh, you know, the, the central tendency is still a lunar one, but they can have a couple of degrees of error, you know, either way. So it doesn't seem like a priest is there showing them how to align their house. They're kind of looking around and, and saying, I think it's, it's this direction. Uh, um, you know, so it's not so precise. Interestingly, we even have some field houses around both Pfeffer and Emerald field houses, meaning little short-term summertime huts where somebody would live to watch the cornfield. Those are also aligned to these lunar positions. Uh, so the idea is pervasive, uh, probably again, kind of like unlike Chimney Rock where you know all the, all the local houses are not aligned to the moon. In this case they are, but then there's degrees of uh, precision uh, in, around Cahokia. Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, so then I'm trying to weave these different uh, questions together. You know, there's a lot of different topics here, but um, uh, so, you know, you, you talk a lot about in this, in this presentation that, you know, reference chimney rock and just the similarities there, but um, are, is there evidence of any direct, you know, exchange between the Southwest and, and uh, Cahokia in, in the system? Um, uh uh, some people may, I'll be blunt, no, <laughs> because it's not about trade, mm. especially not for Cahokians. Um, they are pretty far away. So there may be, you know, trade of a sort between Chaco and Mesoamerica, but between Cahokia and Chaco or Cahokia and Mesoamerica, no, there is no sustained trade. 
But that may be not, that's not the most important thing driving this. The most important thing is this desire to understand the outside world and to travel to these places. And you can see Cahokians are traveling up and down the Mississippi and they're building a shrine complex in Western Wisconsin, which is kind of remarkable. So they're traveling widely. Uh, they don't stay there, they're not colonizing, they're going back home. And so it's a good bet you know, because this is Santa Fe Trail um, was probably there for a long time, that there was some movement of people occasionally um, over along it, or they went, Cahokians went down river into the cattle world and then hopped down into Mesoamerica. So I think that's, that's where the, that's really important. And it's been underemphasized. And that's probably the most important thing accounting for why do you get chimney rock and emerald at the same time? Uh, they probably were aware of each other. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm trying to just wrap my head around, around, uh, how to, how to weave this in with, with some of the other ones, but, um, no, that's really interesting. So, so you could, so it's more than goods and, and exchange. And you're talking about, you know, kind of these bigger concepts of, of what ties the world together. That's really interesting. Um, so then, um, what kind of connections and since these are all all three of these cultures are the southwest mesoamerica and, and cahokia are farming cultures um at least in in the time periods you're talking about um one person was asking about um if there's any type of connection between like the yellow clay floors and maybe like maize pollen or have you guys done peabot analysis of those um deposits and found anything other than the clay in there? Uh, there is still a study yet to happen. We, we have taken micromorphology samples of some of those yellow floors. Uh, we, we, we haven't completed that yet. Generally speaking, those yellow clays are devoid of anything but yellow clay. Uh, and that's probably why they are used to purify a location because it's a pure substance. Uh, but there are some, there are some floors where there might be some pollen, I think there is. And we've seen this in, in, the, in our micromorphology samples under the microscope, uh, but we haven't completed that analysis yet. Gotcha, uh, well, we'll be excited to hear how that turns out. Um, so then, and then with the, the greater, or the, the cycles of the moon, does that fit specifically into agricultural cycles as far as you're aware? Uh, I, I would say uh, I didn't make so much of the importance of water and the moon as a water bringer. I just mentioned it. But um, especially for a water sensitive crop like maize, um, I think maize encourages people to pay much more attention to weather um, and to seek moderation of the forces of weather you know, from the gods because you know, too much rain is bad for corn too little rain is bad for corn. You just want the right amount. So the moon, uh, and, I, and I've seen this repeatedly myself. I don't know how many folks have ever watched it. Um, sometimes, especially in the warmer months, before a warm uh, rain system comes in, a warm front, uh, you will see a ring around the moon. And look at Farmer's Almanac, and Farmer's Almanac tells you that's, uh, that means rain's coming. So uh, the moon is then understood as a rain bringer and, and certainly descendants you know, still will recognize that. So it's, it's more about the, the, the cycles and the moon as something that's keyed into both the, you know, uh, the annual cycle and then this long generational cycle that then kind of ties into corn and agriculture. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Well, so you brought up a good point. Um, that some of the folks were asking about is what do uh, or do modern, um, you know, present Native American communities have anything to say about about the lunar cycles or, or any of the, the anything uh, like that? Uh, I mean, it's still very important. Um, uh, and it's uh, especially as a feminine power. Uh, so it's associated with women and fertility again, like crop fertility, and um, also the ancestors. Um, and you can kind of see that in the way they're building the moon into a place like Cahokia. I mean, it's also tied into ancestors. And as you were just asking, agricultural fertility. 
So it, it's important still, the knowledge of the long lunar cycle was, was lost somewhere probably in the 13, 1400s, or, or maybe not lost, but put away. So you don't see these lunar uh, alignments in major ceremonial sites after that time. Uh, and much like, you know, in the, in the Chaco world, you see the shift away from those too, from P, P3, you know, Mesa Verde, where there's still some of them there, into P4, where they're gone. Same kind of thing happens in the East. You have early Mississippian while they're, where they're there, and then late Mississippian, they're gone, which is another interesting parallel, and I can't quite explain that one. Huh, that's really interesting. Um... Wow. So then, um, gosh, let's see here. There's, there's, I'm, I'm trying to bridge some questions here. Uh, uh, how do you think they would have marked these, these lunar alignments? Like, how do you, what are your thoughts on how they would have, you know, mapped those out at these sites, like the physical process of that? Uh, I, I think it, it, it would have started with, um, observations, maybe more than one generation's worth of observations, where someone earlier on tells someone else, maybe has a diagram on it, of it on a, a, a hide, which certainly people used as a writing you know, material, um, and pass that along. But it, it's certainly something that, you know, it changes with latitude and the angle, you know, the horizon angle. So it, you have to be in that place to get it right for a long period, like 20 years, if not more. So I think probably what was going on is at some point people understood that it does vary a little bit depending on where you are and they uh, would occupy some area and figure it out uh, and then um, you know, record it as best they could. Uh, yeah, and that's why it's also easy to, easy to forget, right? I mean, it's, it's not something that you, you know, without a writing system, which, you know, Chaco and Cahokians never had, uh, it's our trigonometric kind of system. It's not something that's easy to move out of a place to a, another place. Um, so I'm, I'm still kind of amazed by it, the extent of it, um, especially in the Cahokian world. I mean, they, they adjust it. They move up. They change the angles. They figure it out. Uh, as opposed to where, you know, some Southern location. Um, now, if you're, if you're asking, or if this person's asking about um, how you lay out a, a site, um, it's simple. And, um, and actually Steve Lexon does a good job of explaining this in the Meridian book. Uh, it's, it's simple um, uh, uh, surveying instruments, uh, a, a stick with a plumb bob, um, and then aligning it, you know, uh, visually, and you're going to get error, but if you do it enough and you, you know, double check, you can perfect it some. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, we get that question a lot. Like how do people build in the Southwest? How do these people build these big Pueblos at straight walls? And, you know, they, they have, uh, some kind of alien influence and we're like, well, you know, to make a straight line, you need two sticks and a string, you know, yeah. um, exactly. <laughs> and exactly. people are, have a lot of ingenuity that way um no no that's great that's great um so you mentioned 12 uh the the 12 uh in, in the first uh slide sorry the um the emerald uh acropolis what was the significance again of those 12 is that something oh um i mean besides being a multiple of four uh you know or, or three or four i mean i think I'm not sure about this because it, it, it occurs. I mean, it's there at Emerald. And so I'm thinking it is an understanding that within the span of a solar year, there are 12 months or 12 lunar cycles, you know, short cycles. And so that's an acknowledgement in my eyes, that's an acknowledgement of that simple, you know, uh, pattern of 12 months. Hmm, interesting. Um, well, so yeah, we just have a couple more and, um, and I've, I've kind of done all the streamlining I can. So there's a few that are kind of a little different directions, but uh, one, one person was asking about uh, the, the black drink. Um, and if you saw some parallel between that and, you know, the places where these, uh, these major lunar events were, were observed, like this, are those, 
did that co-occur or do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I, I skipped over it for this talk, but there's a Southern Cahokian uh, shrine complex. And um, my graduate student, Caitlin Antonuk is taking this on as her dissertation project. It's lunar aligned. It's got these little Cahokian houses. They, they go there in the late 11th century. And, and this is in Northwestern Mississippi. Um, and there you're getting right near the home range or the natural range of, of uh, Yalpan Holly or Yopin Holly, um, which is the, the material for the black drink, which is a caffeinated tea. Um, and you can make it pretty strong. Uh, so the thought is that there's a, there is a link there and Cahokians do import the leaves of the Yopin Holly. Um, I, don't, I don't know that it's connected in any way to the moon, but it's definitely a, you know, very much a Cahokian thing. And wherever there are Cahokians, there are lunar alignments. That's it. And then do you have any evidence of that plant in, in like the, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Trempolo? I th I'm not saying that right, but um, uh, we, we, Trempolo, we, we haven't looked for it there. Um, uh, you know, that we discovered it thanks to Patty Crown, because when Patty discovered chocolate in the, in the um, Choco in jars, we, uh, I heard a talk somewhere and I said, you know, we've got these beakers. They're kind of like big coffee mugs. So uh, we put together a project and we tested those looking for chocolate. And instead we found the open holly. Um, and so it does seem to be something that Cahokians are drinking in these, there's a, it's a well-known Cahokian drinking vessel. It looks like a Puebloan mug, except a little bit bigger. <laughs> um, uh, so those are at Trempolo. They are also wherever Cahokians are, you find those. We've tested them around Cahokia for the black drink. It's there. I presume it's up at Trempolo and down south in Mississippi and everywhere else that there are Cahokians uh, and rituals. Yeah, so it's more of a related complex of, of features and ideas than necessarily black drink uh, lunar alignments. But, exactly. Okay, yeah. interesting, interesting. Um, so let's see here. Um, I guess, um, uh, let's see here, how do, how do I relate this question here? Um, Sounds like a tough one. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's more, let's see, about uh, uh, the Mesoamerican connection. And um, I guess kind of related to what I was asking about um, if there was direct connection or direct trade evidence between Chaco and, and the Cahokia, do you have direct or what kind what can you say about the exchange between Mesoamerica and Cahokia? Uh, it's a whole other talk. Yeah, sorry, and, that's, that's, uh, that's it's not it's not trade. Mm -hmm. uh, there there is are, are links. Um, and it's potentially through this this culture in the middle that maybe some some uh, viewers are familiar with the Caddo, um, which sometimes are called Caddo, Mississippi, and they're kind of on the you know, on the edge of the Southern Plains, but still in the woodland areas. And cattle people are clearly uh, um, in some ways connected to Cahokia early on. And there are probably even some cattle people from the Red River of Texas and Arkansas at Cahokia now, we think, based on pottery that, we, that we've that we been finding. Uh, and they also have the same kind of configurations of causeways and circular and rectangular mounds as you see at Cahokia. And it gets you a big step closer to Mesoamerica. Uh, in Mesoamerica, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to make this short, but in Mesoamerica, you have this, uh, especially in, starting in the 900s, you have um, a kind of a cult to the wind that brings rain god, you know, Quetzalcoatl. And that, that god is associated with circular platform mounds all the way up to Tamaulipas, Mexico, which is a, you know, hop, skip, and a jump you know, from, uh, from the Mississippi Valley, you know, via a canoe or a boat traveling along the Gulf. You see circular platform arms also in the Caddo area and also at Cahokia, shortly after you see them in this Huastec region of the Tamaulipas. So uh, there's more work to be done there, but I think that's, I'm not sure it's a smoking gun, but that's the connection. It's, it's this religious 
um, movement or cult that's connected to a wind that brings rain god, that's connected to corn and fertility, and yada, yada, yada. Wow. Well, hopefully um, you'll be able to come back and give us a, a talk about that sometime soon. Although <laughs> that sounds like it's a, 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 there's a lot to that. It sounds really fascinating. Um, well, that pretty much wraps up uh, the, the questions that we have for tonight. Um, so, and I don't want to keep you too long either, but I, so I just want to say thank you so much, um, doc, Dr. Packard, for, for coming in and speaking with us is, uh, you know, really, really fascinating. Um, and so if, is it okay if, you know, if people do have questions um, that they throw at us, can we, you know, maybe send those on to you and, and you can respond to those as, as you see? Sure. Uh, would be okay. Okay, great. Yeah, sure. Um, well, great. Well, thank you again so much for, for coming and giving this really, really interesting presentation. We had several hundred people tuning in, and I'm sure they'll be tuning in again on the YouTube channel. So uh, thanks again, and um, thank you, everybody, for, for showing up. Yeah, thank you.